chat. There we go. So we are very happy to welcome Hillary Stein as our featured artist, artist of December this month. Um, many of you, or maybe all of you already know Hillary, but I'm just gonna do a quick little background and then hand it over to her. Um, so Hillary, who is a graduate of St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota, first came to X um, and the Leo Marshute School in the fall of 2012 then returned as an apprentice for the 2014-2015 academic year, and finally spent two years studying at the master's level from 2017 to 2019. So like many of our artists that we've had up to this point, she's one of those people that has returned over and over again, which I think we all know by now is a theme of the Marshute School. Um, Hillary now is a working artist and art teacher in Western Colorado. And this past September 2022, we were so lucky to have help Hillary help lead um, the museum study seminar program we did in Washington, DC. Um, and we are just overjoyed to feature Hillary this month um, in this format and to host this Zoom with her. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna hand it over to Hillary to give her talk. Cool. Hey everyone, it's so exciting to see you all in this format. I'm usually really Kind of overwhelmed by zoom calls and don't um enjoy them particularly but this is just like such a joy to see all of your faces in one on one screen and um see you in your little world that you yeah in a, in a little square but anyways i'm actually going to um put a little slideshow on um that will help me stay organized um so i'm gonna do that now um just just try <coughs> okay cool um well rose just gave a lovely introduction already and i think most of you do know um my story but i guess i'll just kind of summarize really quick what led me to the marshall school originally um so i think we all have unique stories to to share about how we landed here and why and what in particular led us to be a part of the school. Um, and for me, I um, was studying something entirely different than art, but I think I'd always considered myself an artist. Um, and then just by happenstance had happened to meet um, John's son, Johan in Peonia, Colorado, where I grew up um, working in a bakery. And um, I think at the time I was doing a, a small, uh, what I guess you could call it a, um, well, it was a nonprofit um, thing I was working on doing some portraits of uh, children in Rwanda. Um, and then the portraits would be sold for, to, um, uh, to support the children in this orphanage. And Johan saw my paintings and said, it's great that you, you know, want to be a humanitarian and all, but have you ever considered just being an artist? Um, Cause you know, it seems like that's what you're good at. And um, I think I had never really had anybody um, say it so clearly or um, with such confidence that that was a path that I could actually pursue. Um, then he gave me the book uh, about Marshutes and um, something just really resonated, something really clicked with me that was like, you know, wow, I didn't know that this kind of education was even available, really. Um, I think most of us can relate going to any um, four-year university in the U.S. There's like a pretty strict kind of um, path that you take and you know, um, limited, well, seemingly limited options of, of what um, is appropriate to pursue, and especially in the arts. And I think what I was really longing for was simply, and not simply, but um, an opportunity to learn and to be and to dive deep. Um, and I think that, yeah, the Marshall School um, offered that to me, and um, and I'm just so grateful for that. Um, and yeah, I just I wanted to reflect on something John said. I remember so vividly, like the first um, seminar we were. I, I had no idea really what I was getting into. I knew it was a going to be an, a you know an inspiring education um, in the arts, but I didn't I didn't know exactly you know what it entailed. And I remember him saying that art is not something that you hold at arm's length and consider, but it's something that goes deep into the core of your being. And I think that's exactly what I was longing for at that time as a 19 year old, um, just having a couple of years of undergraduate education under my belt. 
um, and kind of just skimming the surface of so many things, I was really longing to, to go deep and take the time to step back and really look. And um, yeah, and this goal just offered that to me in a way that I really needed. Um, and so I, I put this quote, me voila, en pays connu, as we know, Marshutes um, was known to say when he arrived um, in X. And I think um, that's how I felt when I arrived there also. Like here I am in a, in a familiar place, in a place that, um, that I had known without knowing it um, before. And so, yeah, I, um, and as Rose said, I've had like um, many, I guess, three different chapters at the Marshwood School. So I came originally as um, an undergraduate study abroad student in the fall of 2012 and um, just had an incredible time. Um, that is so much so that I wanted to stay for another semester and um, couldn't do that. So I ended up coming after I graduated from St. Catherine University. I um, ended up doing a double major in French and photography. I had to find like a, a path. And I think I really struggled when I returned to figure out what avenue I should um, pursue. And I think being in the US, there's like such a pressure to do something really pragmatic. And so I chose um, photography so that I could make a living basically. Um, but I knew that I wasn't done with my journey at the Marshwood School. And so I decided to return as an alumni fellow for a year, the 20 year of 2014 through 2015. Um, and I was able to do the whole program, year long program and really see what it was all about. And um, I think I learned in that year that um, being involved in education in some form was um, kind of where I would fit best in the world of art in addition to like creating on my own. Um, so then I returned to Minneapolis and taught art for a couple of years, just sort of part time and um, worked in an artist community. Um, and then eventually returned back to the Marshall School again for a two for the two year master's program. So I, um, like I said, I just really couldn't get enough. And I think I was just hungry for the exactly the kind of education that um, the school offered and really just the opportunity to be undistracted and to dive deep into an artistic practice is a really hard thing to find um, in the United States. I think like probably many of us can relate as artists who um, try to find their way um, in, yeah, in our, in our modern society that is, um, was challenging. It's challenging, I think, in reflecting on and preparing for this talk, I realized the biggest challenge is just finding the space um, and ability to slow down and just look, um, look into the world and look and to kind of be in a kind of meditative state of being in the world is, is hard. And I think that, um, yeah, my time with Marshoots really, it was that, it was like this constant um, state of deep, deep looking, deep seeing, um, which leads me to, yeah, my next point, which is really, um, the importance of seeing. And I think now as I'm, I think I didn't mention this, but I'm teaching art now, um, kindergarten through eighth grade, which is a wide range of um, grades to be teaching. And I think like the overarching um, truth that I'm finding that is the most important thing in teaching art and learning art is the value, sorry, got a dog over here, um, is the value of really, looking um, and how where we actually do that well in the world. Um, and so I'm gonna take him aside, come here, come here, come on, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, okay. Um, so I love this quote by Annie Dillard, um, that is our task as artists is to continually search and to shed our many layers which inhibit us from seeing um, and I find that to continue to be my task. I don't think it's one that really has a, an end date, but it is to continuously search and to, um, and exactly as you said, to shatter many layers which inhibit us from seeing. And I think um, 
just being a human in the modern society, that's a really difficult thing to do to um, kind of get outside of yourself and to humble yourself um, to the task of looking, um, which I just think is the most valuable um, lesson that I've learned and, and, and feel so compelled to share that with my students. Um, yeah, let's see what else. Um, yeah, and so I think just again, like reflecting on on my whole journey with the Marsh Street School and what it has been for me, that's one of the biggest lessons that continues to keep giving to me, um, how important that is. And I was reminded of that when we did um, our museum study seminar in Washington, DC, um, just seeing many, many of the participants were um, had been involved in the school before, but some of them hadn't. And just seeing that transformation and being a part of that um after the first session spending an hour in front of a painting we had one participant turn to me and just say like wow thank you so much for that meditation and I was like yeah you're right that was that's what that was that was a meditation and how like often in our lives do we have that chance to to meditate upon not just a painting in this case it is like a you know something that a human has created but also looking at anything for that long and really considering it and kind of returning to that beginner's mind, um, how like fruitful and incredibly nourishing that is to just, to kind of like shed those layers and become like a blank, a clean blank open slate, like a conduit, you know, for, for something to speak through. And I think that that is my process and continue, has been, was throughout the master's program and continues to be. Um, it's just kind of constantly returning to that mindset or trying to. And it's, I think, one of the biggest challenges um, that I face um, is just trying to maintain that, especially being an educator in a um, really kind of um, stressful, like high paced um, environment where I'm like switching between grades every hour of the day um, to just try to remain like centered and mindful um yeah so what did I say I'm just reading minutes um yeah it just it's really challenging to sustain that kind of depth of being in the world but I really do find it to be my task as an educator to inspire this kind of looking into the world and I hope to create to continue to create paintings that call one to look deeper in this way as well um so yeah, I did a little bit of reflecting on my process paper that I wrote for um, the master's program. And it really was so much about this journey of letting go. Um, and I think that the practice of painting really uh, is unique in that sense and in, in that you really can't approach the process of painting with a cluttered mind. Um, and I think Nick also talked about that also. Um, it, as the process of painting being like also a, a process in um, men healing and mental health. And um, I think that it, it really is that for me. Um, so I'll just keep on going. I have a painting next. Um, so as I was reflecting back into my experience in the um, MFA program, I was really compelled um, almost like in a feverish way towards this motif of a uh, forest scene in Borokoi where we go to paint and we all paint the mountains, you know, the incredible Mont Saint Victoire. And I was always so moved by that, but almost in a, almost felt like not, cap not um, ready for the task of painting it. I could, I felt like I needed to kind of go inward a lot more. And so that this, this motif really allowed me to do that, to kind of untangle the depths of myself. I think I wrote about a lot in my process paper um, before this very frenzied scene. Um, and there's something about that task of just continuously going back to the same scene and, and coming to know it more and more every session, I was able to kind of unravel it more and more and simultaneously unraveling myself. And I think that that's, um, again, another really incredible Thing about the uh, aspect of the program and my shoots the pedagogy is like really that looking into nature and simultaneously looking into the self um and so that this this painting really represents that um effort for me to kind of um 
just meditate upon this this frenzied scene and try to kind of bring order to the chaos that I was seeing. Um, and so, yeah, the word that came up was called in French, uh, l'enchevêtrement, which is like, which is the entanglement. And um, a professor at one of our open houses um, said like, that said that that's what this reminded her of. And so that became a theme, I think, for the two years, this entanglement. Um, and yeah, so I also was spending a lot of time studying um, this painting, Mountain Temple, which I'll show later on, that was painted by a, a Zen Buddhist monk. And I think um, Eastern thinking was certainly like permeating my um, process, my thought process throughout that semester. And I started to um, learn a little bit about the Buddhist notion of sunyata, which is kind of this emptiness, which is simultaneously the all and this state of kind of eternal becoming. Um, and so I think I was kind of in this process of trying to unravel this scene, I was sort of seeking that that state of of um, unra of, of openness, um, which leads me, okay, here's another example of that forest scene. And I think in this um, scene, I was um, called more towards that um, opening. And um, in the back center of this painting, there's a little orange light that appeared. And I found that I was kind of turning towards that that center. Um, and so this, I feel in looking back, I feel like there was a progression from this painting, which kind of um, was sort of flattened in some ways, I think. Um, uh, there was more, there was a, a turning towards an openness in this painting um, that I think marked a, a step in um, progress on my journey, um, which then there was a kind of radical shift Maybe I'll come back to this later and pause on it, but just to um, kind of carry forward that point I was making about openness. Um, I had kind of a radical shift when we went to Giverny, I think it was the second year of the MFA program. Um, and I went out at sunrise on the sun to um, paint the sunrise. And there was just this incredible beautiful moment that the sun broke through the the fog on this on the river and sort of broke the light and into color everywhere um kind of simplified the scene that I was struggling so much to bring into togetherness um and yeah so this this is that was kind of represented that that um state of openness um bareness nudity kind of um, the word in French, dépouillement, was the one that I was meditating on a lot, which kind of is, yeah, reflective of this, this um, unraveled state, kind of very much in contrast to the paintings I was doing um, prior to, to these. Um, and so this kind of just represented a shift, I think, in my artistic process through those two years and really kind of just, yeah, opened something within me. These paintings were really, really significant um, to me in this process. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just keep keep on chugging. If we want to come back over in the questions to look back at any of these, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, I think I just was really compelled and continue to be compelled also towards this motif, which I wrote about my paper as being um, sort of representative of both how nature is infinite parts, but also so um, emphatically one. I think maybe it was Jamin's words I used there. I was writing some notes about that. I love that um, statement. Uh, so yeah, again, this kind of represented a shift um, in my work towards volume, which is what I wrote about in my process paper. Um, and I love this quote by Annie Gillard again. Um, but there is another kind of seeing that involves a letting go. When I see this way, I stand transfixed and emptied. Um, I think that that's really how I felt that morning, just completely transfixed and emptied, open. Um, and I think this is that's this is what I was seeking so much leading up to this session was that moment of clarity. Um, that would arrive occasionally, but the 
and I think it continues to be, and any of the painters on this talk, I'm sure can relate to um, the struggle of painting and that, that it's kind of a constant battle and there are like a few moments of clarity where things come together. And, and, and those moments are worth all the, the struggle. Um, and yeah, so that, yeah, I think, um, let's see, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, just on, on this point towards volume, though, I think that part of this this shift and towards the end of the MFA program was that I also started to practice cer um, ceramics. And so there's something about the concreteness of um, actually bringing something into a hole, like with my two hands on the wheel, creating something voluminous, something capable of, of, of holding life, uh, um, a vessel um that helped me also do that in my painting um so i think this painting is an example of sort of what happened immediately after that trip um i started to kind of render more volume in my work i think um moving from that first painting i showed which um i think i had a tendency to sort of flatten the frenzied world that i was consumed by and um yeah, this I think this painting I remember being a big shift in our in our critiques about um, just kind of like being able to capable being capable of rendering volume um, and and being able to communicate more clearly what I what I was seeing. Um, and again, I think that practice of um, ceramics was really um, influential in that process and continues to be because I think I'm um I'm a very like concrete learner and I need to kind of feel. Um, I need to be in the world in in it, you know, with my hands and feel the cold air on my skin. Like I painted this on a really freezing cold morning on February and the Mistral was blowing like crazy. And I think I painted this with my left hand. And um, I think I need to feel that sense of urgency to communicate. Um, because when I try to just paint or, or manifest, I, I can't manifest that that feeling. It has to be experienced. Um, and I think that's a, a theme in my life. I'm, um, and I think I, that's also a struggle to kind of maintain a, a consistent painting practice when the best paintings I've done, I think, come out of this, this state of, um, of urgency, um, which can't be um, really created that easily. Um, so I think that's something I've been struggling with is to kind of keep, to continue to paint regularly. Um, to not have to always be in a storm to do so. <laughs> um, yeah, I wrote something on the process paper about about this um, the centeredness that I feel um, throwing pottery. Um, and basically said, it seems that in order to achieve the centeredness and to understand what it means for a thing to be whole in the first place, one must first open oneself to seeing wholeness operating within the natural world. Um, and so that goes kind of back to that theme of seeing that is like just so such a huge takeaway for me um, and then what I continue to kind of instill in my students um, is that in order to create a thing of beauty, you have to first understand beauty in the first place. In order to create wholeness, you need to understand what that is. And I think that um, that's something that is so difficult for most modern humans to do, especially young kids who are so in this world of instant gratification. It's really hard for them to slow down and look into the world. Um, but I think it's really the most important thing we can do. Um, and then another thing I wrote about these, per these flowers in particular, I just wanted to kind of reflect on for a moment is, um, yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'll read this. Okay. The flowers on the table became less and less simply flowers held within a vase on a table, but transformed into something, into an expanding vision of great mystery, which somehow began, began to shed light on the nature of my own. It was in this way an ever deepening conversation between the perceiver and the perceived. And I think that for me, that's really what my practice of painting always is, is a conversation between me, the perceiver, and the thing being perceived. Um, and when it's not, it's very visible <laughs> when that conversation is one-sided. Um, 
So yeah, okay, I'll keep moving. Um, this is a painting I did shortly after, I think, or before this one um, was that that winter. Um, and this is a, another kind of an example of this continuing theme of mine of painting in, in the woods and what is to be found there and um, just how the, the, these are Aspen, an Aspen forest um, near where I grew up. And this space has just been a sanctuary for me my whole life um, and continues to be so. And towards the end of this presentation, I'll show a few of my re recent paintings of these same Aspen trees. Um, but again, I think it's interesting to show like the shift that has happened from the first painting to this one and moving towards kind of a more clarity and openness. Um, not to say one is better than the other because I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's really curious to see the shift and what was um, changing in me throughout those two years. Um, this was done towards the end of those two years. Um, yeah, and uh, this reminded me too of the wonderful words of Leo Marschutz that about art. Um, he says it it appears when the artist has discovered their own light, and the journey of this program has really been a journey towards rediscovering that light, or discovering it for the first time. Um, it's really been a journey through the entanglement, through the tangled confusion of my own inner self challenged by the continuously renewed plenitude of the natural world and the imperative desire to hold together that the frenzy of it all to to a, an attempt to more deeply see and understand the world through the act of painting um yeah and it did this discovery really seems to happen in the kind of selfless doing the sort of surrender into that that tangled state where you might meet the openness um, of a volume which extends outward just as much as it reaches inward. Uh, those are some words from my reflection on the process process paper in the this program. Um, and I think that's continues to be the case for me, um, the truth of my process. Um, and this painting was done on a misty morning in San Diego. So much maybe I um yeah. Let's see, several months uh, after this, this previous painting. And I think um, just kind of speaks more towards the evolution of some themes that I was exploring before, um, painting the Seine in Giverny, for instance. Um, I've noticed that the theme of water becomes really, uh, or continues to be really present in my work. Um, and also just the, the way in which kind of the light reflects, refracts through the fog, filling the air with color. Um, and then this painting I did, I guess I should talk about this a little bit. Um, so after the Marshutes program, the MFA program, I returned to the kind of real world of working for a, a year and um, the pandemic kind of caused, called uh, a really um, sort of inward pause in life. And I decided to um, hike across the state of Colorado where, where I grew up. Um, it was like almost 500 miles. It was a big journey and I felt um, really compelled to return to this kind of like deep contemplative state that I was able to find in the Marshutes program and was a kind of challenged to maintain that in. Um, in the real world. Um, so I, I needed this moment to have this kind of like a very concentrated amount of time um, in direct contact with the natural world. Um, so I had about a month, just me on the trail through these really treacherous, treacherous terrain. It was very harrowing, humbling experience. Um, and this painting is a result of that experience. This is one morning um, uh, after a two or three days of just like walking in that, the whiteness of this cloud um, high about over like 10,000 feet of, um, of elevation. I was walking in and in this crazy storm and I came to discover a lot about myself in that time. Um, and yeah, I did a quick watercolor sketch of this scene um, from my tent cause it was pouring down rain and I had to set it up like in a flurry. 
Um, and then I went back and um, painted it in my studio um, in oils. So this, um, this is one of my more recent paintings after leaving a school that I think um, kind of carries forth that sort of the lessons I was learning. And um, yeah, there's a lot to say about this painting. Um, I, it's hard to kind of summarize, but um, let's see. I think just, uh, oh, also the theme that I wrote my um, critical studies painting on pursuit, um, studying on the mountain temple, this painting. Um, couldn't help but draw some parallels um, to both the theme of um, sort, of, sort of obviously like the, the mist um, is one, but also um, this painting was done by a, a Zen Buddhist monk in the 15th century. And um, this painting is uh, possibly a um, depiction of a known pilgrimage site that many monks went on. And so that theme, I think, of, of being in um, the theme of pilgrimage and being in direct contact with nature um, in solitude is one that I've been um, really interested in for a long time. And um, I couldn't help but think a lot about this painting when I was on that trail alone for so many miles. Um, and so, yeah, look, going back and reflecting on kind of my progress in painting, I couldn't help but think about this, how this painting has influenced how I paint. Um, I spent so many hours writing and looking, looking at this painting, looking into it, breaking it down. I mean, I was, I feel like I was in this painting for a, for a few months. Um, and so it naturally has, I think, been a part of my evolution in painting. Um, yeah, and I think also just the, the, the theme of humility, the necessity of humility and, and kind of humbling oneself before the act of painting, um, which was certainly a part of this artist's journey being a, a monk. Um, it wasn't about becoming famous, making this painting. It was really about a, um, a journey in, into um, enlightenment and discovering truth, um, which is definitely something I think I um, was trying to do on that walk. So yeah, and then this is a painting I did after, um, let's see, uh, yeah, a little while after I finished that, that journey, I came back to um, Western Colorado where I grew up, where the journey all began. And I've been spending a lot of time working at a flower farm, an organic flower farm growing, um, growing flowers. And there's been, I think I, I started doing that just to kind of, it felt good to do so, you know, to kind of fill my time in this sort of unknown zone in the pandemic. Um, and then it became actually really crucial or really important to my artistic process being with, um, much like throwing a pot on the wheel is so concrete and and a part of growing something is, is similar is similar to me. It's so important for me to kind of be deeply involved in that process, um, be in direct contact with the natural world. Um, and so this painting is of peonies that we grew. And so I knew these flowers intimately and this is on a really large scale. Uh, I think it like 40 by 40 or 50, it's a, it's a big painting and I, um, have been painting bigger on a bigger scale, um, which has been a fun um, process also. Um, let's see what else. Oh, I wanted to share another thing that I wrote about flowers. So that's another kind of um, motif that I've been really interested in. And it's not simply because they're beautiful because they are, but I think that there's also so much to be learned from just being with them, being with the process of, of their growth. Um, and one thing I wrote was um, that one can discover the universe turning in such flowers if one is open enough to see it. It seems that we spend so much of our lives trying to name things, trying to contain them, but how much more mystery and richness is to be found in simply standing at a distance in awe allowing the inexhaustible plentitude of nature to unfold before one's eyes. Perhaps one cannot see things as they are truly unless one is capable of at least that openness. Um, so these flowers I painted, for example, are more than the word flowers can say. 
There is something in my relationship to them in those particular moments, how the light and the vibrancy emerged to my eyes, how they called out to me and how I needed them. And again, this painting is a result of a kind of conversation. And there's a tension in the process, a kind of longing that I had no choice but to pursue. Um, and it really is this tension and this longing which propels me towards painting, which brings me into the woods and out into the vast openness of a sunrise, burning the water and the sky as one inexpl inexplicably. This process is much like music, an undulation of tension and release, tension which draws one into the entanglement and releases into the openness. Um, so yeah, just a few words on that. And then lastly, these are a few paintings that I have recently um, done this summer. I was asked to do, um, to fill this big new gallery space um, with Aspen paintings. And so um, I've not really done that before, done as kind of a commission, um, but the Aspen scenes are so important to me. So I felt, um, I felt inspired to, to, to take them up on it. And this part, so this particular group of Aspens is, is just really, um, a deeply important to my life, in my life, as I mentioned before, kind of like a sanctuary. And it's just always offered solace and, re um, refuge. Um, and I painted these actually, um, these are just spring, or spring one, spring two, and summer. Um, love of all these four seasons. So I was listening to that, meditating on that music as I was painting these scenes from drawings I did. Um, it's really hard to hike in the mountains with an easel. So I've started getting in the habit of just doing sketches before, um, like quick watercolor sketches and then taking them into my studio and painting them. And these are also quite big. They're, uh, I forgot exactly the dimensions, but, um, but, but big. <laughs> um, and it's been fun to paint at that scale because it's, um, I think really like liberating. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, it's really just my hope that these paintings I produce might be a call to just contemplate how nature is in all of us, like Cezanne says, and that it just might be a small step towards seeing into the natural world and ultimately towards giving back to it, um, which is a big, I think, part of why I'm so interested in, in um, organic, sustainable farming. Um, and just with um, trying to be mindful of time, I'll just move on to the last slide, which is what I'm doing now, teaching kids um, art. Um, mm -hmm. This is just a little sign they made me recently. Um, so that's what I'm currently doing, spending my time teaching to K-8 students. Um, trying to keep painting and trying to keep making pottery as much as I can um, and just really earnestly trying to get these kids to look at the world um, because they're it's a tough time for kids and I think that um, yeah I'm trying to sort of hold on to the the vocation of in, inspiring them and, and giving them something something um, good in their lives so um, oh I just realized there's chat okay cool um so that's that i can either stop sharing my screen i don't know if you guys can see me too can you yeah okay cool <laughs> um so i guess i could open this up to questions now kind of like um cruise through all of that so if there's anything anybody would like to see or ask about i'd be happy to open it up open up the floor thank you so much hillary um for questions what I've found is the easiest way is if you turn on your um, video, if it's not already on and just put your hand up like this and then I can sort of call people out by name and then you'll just have to make sure to unmute yourself before asking your question. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to just sort of put your hand up. I know there's also a hand um, function on the Zoom itself. Um, why don't I get us started with a question to begin? Hillary, I'm so curious about um, how you sort of balance your um, life as an artist and your life as a teacher and how those two things intertwine. Like, do you use um, your own painting experience to inform the lessons you create for your students? Do the lessons you create for your students then also inform 
your painting practice outside of the school? How do you balance those two things that seem so all consuming to me um, yeah. <laughs> with each other when they're different enough that they take up all, you know, so many different types of space, I imagine, in your life? Yeah, that's a great question and one I really should um, reflect upon um, because mm -hmm. today for, is my first day of winter break, which is great. So I actually, for the first time, have some time. Congratulations. <laughs> um, it's, you yeah, know, that's a great question. And I honest, I mean, the honest truth is I, I am um, struggling. It's really hard to balance. Um, uh, yeah, but I think that the kids teach me more um, than I'm teaching them probably. Um, mm -hmm. In some ways, I think the middle schoolers are really a challenge um, and a reflection of our time and sort of how disjointed it is and how um, much on the surface they want to be and how difficult it is for them to just slow down and take the time to look at anything. But a lot of the lessons I do force them to do that. And I have seen incredible growth and progress in that process, similar to when we were on our um, museum studies trip, just seeing again that like transformation that happens when you do slow yourself down and just look and what you're able to see. I mean, it's incredible and it's like consistently mind blowing to see that happen in young minds, especially because they're so open and capable of seeing things in a way that, you know, that I, that I couldn't imagine. So a lot of, I mean, the lessons are all kind of, I try to cover every medium. It's like one of my tasks, like it's not just painting, um, but it always does come back to like more of an experiential um, learning, which is I'm trying to um, maintain that because I think that's the most effective. And I think that helps remind me to how to approach, continue approaching my painting um, from that like sort of tangible concrete foundation, um, which I think they need and I need. So yeah, I think eventually once I'm able to, I, this is my first year of doing this. So I'm just discovering a lot along the way, but um, I think that eventually that could be a really nice, harmonious kind of, um, sometimes I feel really inspired at the end of the day to want to paint or want to go throw some pottery, and I do, but um, to make it consistent is, is tough. Um, some days I feel like I just want to collapse, you know? <laughs> um, so it's been a really amazing journey so far, and I think they we have a lot to teach each other. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Does Sorry. anyone else have any questions or um, comments for Hillary? I could keep asking questions all day long. Yes, Michelle, you'll have to unmute yourself there on the screen. Let's see. I can't. Let's see. You're, you're muted, Michelle. So if you can um, unmute the microphone. There we okay. go. Hi. Cuckoo. <laughs> Cuckoo. Uh, it's beautiful what you're doing. I mean, those, those flowers, they are exactly what you say. And they are more than flowers. They are the whole uh, universe. And they are, they are very special. You look at flowers and, and they, are, they are different from all what from the other paintings other painter can do and it's great each one has his own eyes and his own way to do them and they are beautiful wow mm. they are beautiful yes thank you yes and and the trees what kind of trees aspen, I love aspen. aspen. aspen trees what yes, aspen. Aspen. in french c'est des des boulots maybe I have to see this. Yeah. They're incredible trees that they're white bark. So they really reflect the light in an amazing way. And what I what is amazing about them is that they are all connected to the same root system. So oh. this particular grove of aspens is the largest one in the world. And so being in it is like being in this in, in one massive organism. Um, wow, that's fantastic. Wow. Mm. And you know, on my computer, the if I move the the light moves, change a little bit, and <laughs> to decide where to how to put my head to see them. <laughs> so it, 
it sometimes it's whiter or darker. How are they in pure? I can see strong accents. I can see strong, strong uh, contrast sometimes. They must be like this, no? Yeah, they are. Um, like I said, they're white, white bark with um, black accents, sort of in like an almond shape, um, and so they the light plays on them in a really beautiful way and it's constantly changing because they're like each of them their own blank canvas mm -hmm. that the light paints on i mean i could i could spend my whole life in those woods painting them i would love to someday it's, it's so incredible yeah. the woman of the woods yeah that's me. <laughs> oh, just a little thing um Johan called me when you were on and he oh. said Say hello to Hilary and where is she living now? Oh, in, yeah, right downtown Peonia. He probably knows the street. Yeah, in, <laughs> he asked me, is she still in Peonia? <laughs> oh, how is Tommy? Uh, Tommy is, um, I don't know if he's happy to have a brother, but uh, he has a brother. <laughs> a brother? Oh my gosh. Yeah, Leo, Leo I have to send yeah send me pictures i'd love to see okay oh. and uh you are, tommy likes to draw scargo oh. <laughs> <Escargo>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, voilà. oh, Je ferme la parenthèse. <laughs> so sweet are there any other questions for hillary we usually try to wrap up at the end of the hour so we have about 10 minutes left alan go ahead i think you're unmuted already Am I unmuted? Yep. Oh, God. Yes. Hillary. <laughs> so incredibly beautiful, your presentation. Mm -hmm. Just kind of takes, kind of takes the breath away. It's hard to know how to, there's so much to talk about and everything you're doing. I mean, I, you know, and I remember when you were writing your papers, I was always, sort of like, because you have such a light-filled, sort of joyous, nice persona. And then, you know, when I start reading your papers and looking at your paintings, just the depth, the deepness of how you are connected to the world and your ability to articulate what you're trying to do in terms of the depth of your vision it's really overwhelming. It's just incredibly beautiful. And I was, I had a question about in your, you know, the world in which you live, are you uh, able to sort of articulate these kinds of things in the world within which you you live and the people around you in your society? How do they, how do they relate to what you're saying and doing? Or, or do you have to keep that kind of to yourself or because it's just so powerful. I just wonder if people are hearing and seeing what you're doing and how do they relate to the depths of your incredible mind, spirit wow. in the world that you're in now. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that the kids really get it, but um, <laughs> even, honestly, the young ones do. They respond really well. Um, the middle schoolers, it's another story. But um, <laughs> but no, I think I'm really fortunate to live in a community, and that's why I've kind of stuck around here, um, is because the people here are really grounded, really um, re um, really of the earth, and have, so the show that I did this summer, showing those, those last Aspen paintings was really well received. And I do think it resonates with people what, what I write. Um, I don't know how, how often or how many, you know, um, but the ones that do tell me and I, I feel seen and heard for the most part, which is good. And I don't, I think more so than in other cities that I've lived, I think because people here are so connected to the, to the earth in a really concrete way. It's such a, it's like more organic farms per capita in this town than most places in the U.S. So, <laughs> um, so I think that, um, yeah, I would love to have, to be able to show more or share more, but I think it always happens in an organic way, in a natural 
way people will receive the work I'm doing or hear about it. And um, it's certainly not um, in abundance, but I think it's meaningful every time it happens when someone does connect. So, yeah. The world certainly needs for you to have a larger platform. Oh. It's just incredible what you're saying and doing especially in the times that we are in, it's something. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. It's because of your teachings why I'm doing it, you know? So, I thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, Nick, go ahead. Nick. You just have to unmute yourself. Can you, can you hear me like this? Yes. Um, so Hillary, you mentioned going back to the real world, and um, I know you've made the transition from the Marshutes world to the real world um, a few times. Mm -hmm. And Rose actually kind of asked the question that I wanted to ask, but I'm going to rephrase it. Um, in the most recent transition from the Marshutes world to the real world, mm -hmm. like specifically the past couple of years that you've 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 we've passed and you've passed what's something you wish you knew upon um leaving the marshutes world um before entering the real the real world this most recent time does that make sense yeah hmm. i don't that's what's something you wish you could go back and tell yourself before leaving the marshutes world and coming back to the real world hmm. Probably just to waste no time in um, in sort of continuing the depth and the habit, the consistency of the kind of work that we do at the Marshall School, um, just to keep that going right away. Because I think the biggest challenge that I face every time coming back from the school, because it's um, it's been different every time, but it is in kind of rediscovering or or um, keeping that going, maintaining that rhythm and that consistency of depth of thinking and seeing and, and the practice of it all. I think that that's just so hard to maintain when you come back into the reality that you previously know, knew. That's why I always like quote unquote rea the real world because it's it's just the one that we're most familiar with, the one that we've spent the, our, you know, the majority of our lives in this country li living in, in the way that we do here. Um, and it's just really hard to, um, yeah, to maintain the kind of like rhythm of life that, that I think we're also privileged to have had um, in the Marshall School and X in a different culture and a different habit of, of mind and of being. Um, so yeah, if I could go back to myself, I would say just waste no time in keeping that up because you can do it. It's, it's just hard to do it right or right away. You know, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the, the first thing I wanted to ask, which Rose kind of asked was like, she asked, how do you sort of balance it all? How do you balance like keeping up painting with your teaching and, and all the hiking that you do and the pottery that you do and stuff? And I wanted to ask you, just because I'm asking myself this a lot, but oh, my mom has a friend coming. Uh, anyways, um, from artist to artist, like what's working for you? You know what I mean? Like what has been working for you ever since you left? And um, uh I feel like I'm hearing a dog in my apartment and on the, <laughs> um, but I think it's happening in my apartment too anyways, but that's why I wanted to ask you like what, um, yeah, what do you wish you could kind of go back and tell yourself? Um, mm. But yeah, no, you definitely answered my question. Cool. Yeah, I think you like what's working is it changes all the time. It's just a matter of intention right? like, mm. and valuing the lesson. Sorry. <laughs> I should have put him in the kennel. He's got a lot to say. <laughs> um, any other questions? No? Alan, do you have another question? Yeah, go ahead and unmute. I mean, I'm always, I'm always saying this, but I'll say it <clears throat> here. I, I, I wish we could come up with different um, adjectives for. I know what you're talking about. That real world. Uh, and I guess as opposed to the Marshutes world, but I'm not sure that the Marshutes world isn't more real than the quote real world 
I mean, I understand what we're meaning by that. Everything that we have to deal with out there. It's not of this world that is actually uh, that Hillary is actually in, but I find her work and everything that she's talking about, actually that is the real world. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's like what I mean about um, not, not losing that sense because it is yeah. that, 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 that depth of being in the world is, is the most real. <laughs> um, it's just hard to continue to value it in a world that doesn't or maybe hasn't had the opportunity to live that way, to see that way, you know? Um, so yeah. I find, yeah. Beautiful. I just balk at that sometimes because it, it makes it sound like, the, you know, this world that you're doing this thing from and what you, I mean, I do understand it because when you're a student over in X, there is this kind of bubble and everything is set up so you can just concentrate, you know, on your work. But uh, it is real. You know, it is a real way of doing yeah. things, figure out how to do it in the kind of mm -hmm. frantic world within which we live. That's part of the problem. You know, that's one. That's the thing, one of the things that's given to us, uh, every century has different issues, you know? And I think that's part of, part of what is so incredible about your work and part of what you've realized in your work is actually because of that, you know, that other world that we're talking about that takes us away from what you're trying to do, all of, all of that 21st century madness actually may be part of the reason why there's such a depth of incredible love in the work mm -hmm. that you're doing. Those two things go together, but I don't know. Absolutely. I think that's a really beautiful sort of note and um, feeling to leave us on. I'm gonna um, let people that need to leave at the hour head off. And I just wanna say a really big thank you to Hillary for taking the time to give this talk and for being our featured artist this month. Um, if you haven't checked out her page on our site, make sure to do that and her website and her Instagram and all of that. Um, Hillary, thank you so much for sharing your paintings and your beautiful words with us. Um, it's really been such a lovely and inspiring talk. Um, and we look forward to seeing what you do next and what you do with us. We're so lucky to have you as part of this community. And thank you to all of you joining the talk. Um, it's been so great to see how many of you all um, have joined month to month with our different artists. So I really thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Um, and it's so good to see everybody's faces. And I just love seeing, Mary, I love seeing your little baby on the screen. So sweet. <laughs> um, baby, Mary, so nice so to beautiful. see you all. Take care, everybody. And um, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year, all of that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Beautiful work, Bye. Hillary. Thank you. So good to see you mm -hmm. guys. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was really incredible to just, yeah, to have this chance to talk and think about it all. So, oh, thank you. beautiful, Hillary. Hillary. So beautiful. We're so lucky to have you on here. Oh, so yeah. lucky. So inspiring, yes. Really. Bisou. Oh, bisou, everybody. Take care. Thank I'm you. gonna end it here. Beautiful <laughs> day. <laughs> oh, so sweet. Oh. Yeah. And I can. I'm gonna leave. And Hillary, you're um one of the hosts. So if you want to stay on and chat with anybody, you're more than welcome to. Um, but I'm gonna log off just really quick, and then. I'll let you guys stay on if you want to. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, Rose. Cool. Of course. Thank you, Hillary. Talk to you soon. And Sam, I'm going to call you in just a few minutes, okay? I'm going to, yeah, I'll call you separately. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'll probably have to log off too, but um, so good. Oh, Hillary. That was just incredible. Oh, thanks. I'm so, I don't know. I'm, 
public speaking on Zoom is like another level. Is it, I, it just feels unnatural. And so I get it. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's strange, but what a beautiful presentation. I mean, just very nice. <laughs> incredible. And your Thank work you. is just so beautiful. You know, you got, yeah. Thank you. you Oh, it was so hard to put it together because I was working all week and the kids were crazy because it's right before Christmas. So I just, <laughs> thank you. It, was, I, it felt really good to look back on everything and just to reread things that I had written, reread the process paper and critical studies. That was just like really nourishing and needed that. It had been too long, I think, since I revisited some of those thoughts. So yeah, your, your paper on the, on the, on the print it's just masterful, you know. I read it again a few few weeks ago. It's incredible. Thanks, Alan. Oh man, I'm I'm gonna get that um, copy framed that of that painting to put in my room. That's yeah. beau, mm. That painting is so incredible. But um, I actually, my computer is about to die. So just a warning, if it dies, yeah. I can just hang up on you guys. It's just because I don't have my charger. Santine. Santine. I wanted to say thank you. Well, I have to. Santi, hi. Hi, Sam. Santi. Santi. <laughs> hey, guys. Wanted to say thank you, Hillary. You you can brave the cold to paint, but when it comes time to present, this, that's scarier than going in the cold to paint. Uh -huh, thank you. It is scary. It is scary. Um, but happy to have done it. That was just a gift to be able to, to share that. Share some we have it on tape. We've got it on that. We've got you on tape now. It's a beautiful thing. So, yeah. Thank you. Right, um, put it on PBS someday. Really? Incredible. Hillary, I have to log off with um, kids waiting for dinner downstairs, but I just wanted to tell you that was a beautiful hour on earth. I feel soothed and enriched and inspired and just thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen. It's so good to see you. And to see I know you too. All right. Well, bye. We love you, Hillary. Love you too. Bon appetit. <laughs> okay. Merci. Ciao. Yeah. Um, I okay. I'm going to go ahead out. out. Bye, okay. everybody. Say okay, bye. Love you guys. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, what a beauty. Bye.